America's economy is war-based, and those who plan it depend upon Christians for their support of those wars. Christian Zionists, by whatever name, are the primary enablers of our serial wars, of the sanctions against other states, and of the occasional occupations of Islamic states at acts of war against other countries. Why do Christians support war when Jesus demanded peace? Because they have been conditioned to think Islam is anathema to them. Celebrity Christian Zionist leaders allow themselves to be used as propagandists against Islamic governments, including Iraq, Palestine, Afghanistan, Somalia, Bosnia, Iran, Sudan, and more. Our purpose is to explain why and how this has been done, and what can be done to change it, because it can be changed. Wars are an official economic policy of our government, which is why we have so many. Wars give governments many advantages for controlling people. But only Christian Zionists believe that war is an integral and necessary part of their religion. This is unchristlike, in error, and conflicts have become perpetual because of it. Christian Zionists, by whatever name, are the only remaining sizable faction that supports wars in places like Iraq. Therefore, responsibility for the economic and social disaster that we now see, including the rising energy and food costs, is largely theirs. As such, Christian Zionists are the darlings of presidential candidates, and sad to say, the seeds of their own destruction. We find them among our friends, families, and associates. Because they are among our best allies, our bosses, even our wives and children, we cannot just turn our backs on them or despise and ridicule them. We need to learn to deal with Christian Zionists. This looks much easier when we understand that Christian Zionism is a promoted religion that makes little sense on its own. It is not believed because it is logical. Endless wars always result in the destruction of the morality and the currency of the aggressor nation. This has happened throughout history, including Great Britain. Christian Zionists can easily be swayed to support war, so long as they believe that Muslims are on the receiving end of our bombs and bullets, and the state of Israel is the beneficiary. We are in no way excusing Jewish war-making Zionists or cowardly congressmen for their role in all this, but for every Jewish Zionist in America, there are 10 or 20 Christian Zionists doing their work for them. Christian Zionists have turned their backs on Jesus' words, Blessed are the peacemakers, and love even your enemy as you love yourself. This is Christianity. Anyone who claims that they follow Christ and fails to stand for justice and protection of the innocent will definitely have some explaining to do. Christianity, as you find in the Christian Bible, which is this, the Christian New Testament, only a few pages long, can be read in, in a very short period of time. Quite a bit of his repetitious stories that, have, that are told over and over again. It, there, it, I have presented this to dozens of pastors and religious leaders and asked them to show me one line in this book that would ever allow any person who calls themselves a Christian to take a life or support a war. The Christian Bible demands peace. The words of Jesus Christ are words of peace. Blessed are the peacemakers. It's probably the most quoted phrase, and there are no exceptions. You cannot go through this and find some place where Jesus in some underhanded way said, well, war is okay on some occasions, or it's okay to kill somebody under certain circumstances. It's just not there. Political change can only come from understanding the roots of Christian Zionism. Americans of all religions need to understand what Christian Zionists believe and why. The vast majority of members and churches who put Israel first before Jesus do not even consider themselves Christian Zionists. They would even deny it. They usually describe themselves as evangelicals, dispensationalists, premillennialists, or just Christians. When they stop and think about it, very few laymen are comfortable with the radical elements of Christian Zionism. Their church is a comfortable social outlet, especially for their families, and they really don't believe in the Christian Zionist jargon that's spoken there. At the apex of the Christian Zionist sect, which is only a little over 100 years old, are media personalities such as John Hagee, Ron Parsley, Pat Robertson, the late Jerry Falwell, and many others. Each has openly expressed the view that war upon Islamic states is necessary, including war against Iran. It is time for America to consider a military preemptive strike against Iran to prevent a nuclear holocaust in Israel. 
Christian Zionism is the only religion that has war as one of its principles, where the people who follow it actually are expected to accept war, where they feel that war is necessary to the carrying out of their religious end, where their view of paradise, where their view of heaven is actually involved in war. No other religion that I know of is anything like that. And, and Christianity itself, based on fundamental Christianity, 2,000 years old, has nothing to do with Christian Zionism 100 or 150 years old. How does one tell who is a Christian Zionist? We have a question litmus test. It's non-invasive and usually welcomed. It is, do you believe that the state of Israel is a fulfillment of biblical prophecy? Do you believe that the modern state of Israel is a fulfillment of biblical prophecy? Oh, absolutely. There's no doubt at all. If Israel is the fulfillment of biblical prophecy, which it is not, then where does Jesus fit in? Jesus or Israel? One or the other is the fulfillment of the prophecy of the Old Testament. There is no room for both. Orthodox or traditional Christians have always believed that Jesus, not Israel, is the correct answer. No other branch of Christianity believes that political Israel is in God's plan for the future. This while ignoring Israel's intolerance, its racism, its constant wars. Israel is to them, the Christian Zionists, the chosen people of God still today. About one-third of the 210 million American adults who identify themselves in polls and censuses as Christian are influenced by Christian Zionism. That's about 70 million people making Christian Zionists the most powerful and coveted voting bloc in the world. This can be seen during any election year. The most obvious example was John McCain's reckless pursuit of the Christian right that led him to gross embarrassment at pulpits next to maniacal Zionists like John Hagee and Ron Parsley, both of whom call for the nuclear destruction of Iran. Rob Parsley has said that America was created expressly for the purpose of destroying Islam. I know that this statement sounds extreme, but I'm not shrinking back from its implications. The fact is that America was founded, I'm going to stagger you right now, America was founded in part with the intention of seeing this false religion destroyed. It is rewarding to us and constructive to God's plan to read that the giant closet Zionist Southern Baptist Convention recently announced with great distress that its membership is falling to the lowest level in 20 years. Perhaps it will return to Orthodox Christianity. We hope so. The teachings of Jesus Christ inescapably demand peace and love of one's neighbor. This has been America's one badge of righteousness. The war between the states from 1861 to 1865 was an assault on the Christian values of justice and morality. It diminished and divided the church. It taught moral Christian men about mass killing. A more direct attack on Christianity came from Oxford University Press in England in 1908 when it published a false and intentionally misleading Bible called the Schofield Reference Bible. Its mission was to inject into the Christian text reinterpretations that made the future state of Israel the way to God. This book was so important that Oxford University Press opened its first branch in the United States to publish it. They had never published an American book before. They had not published Whittier's books, his poetry. They had not published Longfellow. They had not published any of our great American authors, but they published this. The Oxford University Press published the Schofield book, they promoted it into key American seminaries and Bible schools where the beliefs of future generations of pastors could be molded to cloud the peacemaking traditions of Christianity and benefit the state of Israel. Most pastors and teachers were unaware of any danger, since there was no state of Israel at the time. Most of them did not even know the Jewish state was being planned. Few guessed that the Schofield book would be used by secular powers to bend Christians into political and financial servitude to the Chewy state, present-day Israel. American Christianity became increasingly Zionized after 1948 when the state of Israel appeared as a result of the United Nations edict. Oxford University Press was strongly Zionist-influenced, and it provided a huge financial and promotional boost when it opened a publishing branch in New York City. This for the purpose of publishing the Christian Zionist Manual in 1908 
called the Schofield Reference Bible. This book was to be a foundational document upon which Christian Zionism, by a host of other names including evangelicalism, would begin its methodical growth by deception. The founders of world Zionism, especially Heim Weitzman, successor to Theodore Herzl, had much to do with drawing the United States into World War I. A mere handful of dominant American Zionists were able to influence President Wilson, possibly by blackmail, to join the war in Europe over his advisor's objections. America lost over 100,000 men who were entirely innocent of any involvement in European politics. And out of all this, the World Zionist Movement gained a piece of land called Palestine. The land of the Philistine was England's payoff to World Zionism for causing America to enter World War I on the side of Great Britain, which was losing the war to Germany. By 1917, the World Zionist Movement was in high gear toward occupying Arab Palestine after the Balfour Declaration gave them a claim, without title, to any land occupied by the Palestinians. The Schofield Reference Bible was copyrighted in 1909. It is an Old and New Testament with most of the notes in the original text added in the Old Testament. Later, many notes were added to the New Testament as the Schofield Reference Bible was re-edited several times with the most radical change being made in 1967. The book has been updated over and over again, each time by Oxford University Press, uh, always having uh, Mr. Schofield's name on the front of it. In fact, he's listed as the editor in the most recent edition, even though he's been dead for about 40 years. The cover shows the editor, Cyrus I. Schofield, with seven other men on the editorial board. One of these was Reverend James M. Gray, president of the Moody Bible Institute, one of the most influential organizations in evangelical circles of the day. There were also two other seminary leaders on the editorial board. Those lending their names were predominantly heads of seminaries and Christian colleges. What happened is the distribution took place through these seminaries. And then when young pastors were graduated from these schools and they went back out and took a church and started to, to teach from the pulpit, they had one of these in their hands. This is what was given to them. And I suppose that they were probably given to the seminaries. It was likely that the Oxford Press made it was very generous in making sure that all these people had these. What exactly is the Schofield Reference Bible? Let us look critically at just one page of the book that has become the guide for secularist Jews in Israel and evangelical Christians in America to explain why they think present-day Israel has the right to all of the land in the Middle East, beginning with Palestine. Genesis 12.3 is part of the Torah and is quoted in the Koran. These three verses are standard in the King James translation and very similar in other Bibles. Let me paraphrase it as you read the Old English. The Lord told Abram to leave his home and family and go into a land that God would show him. God promised to then make of Abram a great nation, bless him, and make his name great, protect him by blessing his friends and cursing his enemies, and from Abram's seed all the nations of the earth would be blessed. Now for the part that is important to traditional Christians, I quote, In these shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Christianity has for 2,000 years taken this to be the first notice from God of the coming Savior of mankind. Genesis 12.3 is the earliest covenant that God made to Abram, and it is the one used by Israelis and Christian Zionists to justify the idea that the entire Middle East should be Israeli property. I quote, Yet thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, into a land that I will show thee. Zionists of all races interpret the phrase, into a land that I will show thee, as a perpetual land grant to present-day Israel. Now we will examine the most effective corrupter of scripture in history, one Cyrus I. Schofield, a 19th century American. Note on page 19 that the footnotes dwarf the text. Note also that the italicized insertions in between the verses that are not part of the Bible. In the 1967 version of the Schofield Reference Bible, there are more footnotes than in the original 1909 version. And since the death of Schofield in 1921, the footnotes have grown to dwarf the text in these very important pages. Let's look again at the vital footnote 2 found in the Schofield Reference Bible in 1967 on page 19. The footnote reads, God made an unconditional promise of blessing through Abram's seed to the nation of Israel to inherit a specific territory forever. 
But the passage doesn't say anything like this. God orders Abram to go to a land that God will show him, using the first person familiar, thee, meaning Abram and no one but Abram. The passage does not say that God is giving any piece of land to anybody forever. It doesn't say anything about Israel. Now, how complicated is, is it? Leave, leave your land, go where I tell you to go, and I will protect you. How complicated is that? How many footnotes does it take to understand what God was saying to Abraham? I mean, anybody who reads that should be able to figure that out, that that's what the message is. But Mr. Schofield wrote all of this to explain it. In fact, if we accept biblical history, we know that Abram had no children when this happened, and not for quite a while. So there was no person or nation named Israel when this promise was made. There was no state or nation named Israel. The man Israel did not even exist in Abram's imagination when God spoke to him. How then could Schofield or the Oxford University Press say that God was promising the land to the present-day state of Israel forever? Where did the state of Israel get in this? When Abraham was spoken to by God, Israel, the man known as Israel, hadn't been born yet. He was two generations in the future. And he was not a state. He was a person that eventually had a tribe. And then after him, 3,000 years later, along comes a bunch of Europeans who name their state after him. But this says that God gave that land to the nation of Israel forever. Imagine 70 million people who are taught this every day. The Oxford University Press did not stop there. No. 3 on page 19 reads, There is a promise of blessing upon the individuals and nations who bless Abram's descendants, and a curse lay upon those who persecute the Jew. The word Jew is used in the footnotes in describing an occurrence two to three thousand years before the word Jew existed. In fact, Jew is taken from the name Judah, who was, it is told, one of the twelve grandsons of Abraham, Abram of Genesis 12. Neither Judah nor Jew existed, and this footnote is a false concoction. Note 3 continues, God's promised Abram and his seed certainly did not terminate at Sinai with the giving of the law. The New Testament and Old Testament are full of post-Sinai promises concerning Israel and the land which is to be Israel's everlasting possession. Listeners should be asking, why is Oxford University Press putting words in the mouths of the readers of this Bible? to make them think their God promises blessings and curses on people today based on how they think about or act toward present-day Jews and present-day Israel. What about all the other people in the world? Let's read further in the footnotes to Genesis 12.3. Promise to the Gentiles. I will bless them that bless thee. Those who honor Abram will be blessed, and curse them that curse thee. This was a warning literally fulfilled in the history of Israel's persecution. It has invariably fared ill with the people who have persecuted the Jew, and well with those who have protected him. And here is the punchline. For a nation to commit the sin of anti-Semitism brings inevitable judgment. The future will still more remarkably prove this principle. Isn't that convenient? So, so now you have anti-Semitism is created in Abraham's time. Uh, the, the footnote to Abraham's words create and the word anti-Semitism. Christian Zionism believes that our nation will be judged if we are not sufficiently kind as a nation to the state of Israel. They have made sin a sort of a national corporate event rather than an individual thing. Of course, there is no such thing as national sin. Nations don't sin. We do. Individuals do. Men do. But this has created a national sin so that Christian Zionists like John Hagee believe that God will rain fire down on our country, will somehow punish our entire nation for being insufficiently kind to the state of Israel. Zionist-friendly Oxford University Press says in our Bible that the whole country will be considered in sin, and we will be in line for judgment from God if we are not properly friendly to the nation of Israel. And remember, there was no Jew in the time of Abram. There was no Israel at the time that Schofield penned the original notes, and it is doubtful that Cyrus Schofield would have even understood the enormity of the evil purpose for which his book was written. It was to have the most prominent Zionist publisher in the world, and it would deify a country that did not exist, and would be born of force, 
40 years after his death. Not all Orthodox Christians were asleep during that time. Philip Morrow was one who saw both the heretical and the war-making dangers of the new religion and actually called it Zionism. Morrow was a well-known patent attorney, counsel for the Columbia Phonograph Company, and a Christian researcher who wrote legal briefs for William Jennings Bryan's famous court cases. In his 1927 book entitled Gospel of the Kingdom with an Examination of Modern Dispensationalism, Philip Morrow wrote, Through an incident of recent occurrence, I was made aware of the extent, far greater than I imagined, to which the modern system of dispensationalism has found acceptance among Orthodox Christians, and also the extent correspondingly great to which the recently published Schofield Bible, which is the main vehicle of the new system of doctrine referred to, has usurped the place of authority that belonged to God's Bible alone. Philip Morrow tells us that he had been caught up himself in the evangelicalism or Christian Zionism of his day and learned about it from the inside. This has been the case with most of us who come to an understanding of Christian Zionism. The late Philip Morrow had been a source of encouragement to many critics of Judeo-Christianity who thought they were alone. Philip Morrow was a dedicated scholar with an engineer's logic and a lawyer's tenacity. That allowed him to foresee error in 1927 that Christian scholars are only beginning to acknowledge 80 years later. We, like Morrow, should also be profoundly sympathetic for those who are caught up in the error of Christian Zionism, dispensationalism, or Judeo-Christianity by any name, because they are among our families and best friends. Jesus' words require that we reclaim them back to traditional Christianity. Dr. F. Furman Curley is another unsung Christian scholar who saw the path to war in the error of dispensationalism. He was the head of graduate studies at Abilene Christian University. In 1983, he wrote a short book entitled The Middle East Crisis in Biblical Perspective, in which he takes sharp issue with those he calls Israel First Millennius and Christian Zionism's evil fruits of perpetual war in the Middle East. He names Hal Lindsey and the late Jerry Falwell as radical Zionist prophets who would help nudge the U.S. into endless war with Islamic states. Dr. Curley explained why. When the concept of Armageddon, as in Revelation 16.16, 16, is raised, those who believe in a literal war at Armageddon often feel that Christians should work to start this war and should vigorously participate in it. Those in particular who view this present situation as Armageddon believe that Christians should support Israel with vigor and they urge our government to take an active part in the conflict in the Middle East. Curley saw Christian Zionist support for Israel's brutal occupation of Palestine as a precursor to more wars in the Middle East and concluded, one needs to be absolutely certain that the doctrine he follows is God's and not of men before he advocates a doctrine that would put the blood of other men on our hands. He explains the neo-Christian love affair with war as a religious fixation, stating, Whereas Christians must pray for peace in the Middle East, premillennialists must pray and work for World War III so Armageddon will come. They cannot pray for peace in the Middle East. If a follower of Christian Zionism will only examine the simple teachings of Jesus in the New Testament, he will find there is not a single passage or phrase that would give a follower of Christ the cause to take the life of another man or another man's wife or a child in a faraway country. No such biblical permission exists. This missile raid took place um, over Gaza, Gaza City, and uh, I was staying in a building that was owned by the Southern Baptist Convention, and they'd had it from there from the time that they actually had missions in Gaza City. They still owned the building, probably nobody to sell it to. You can, probably can't sell buildings there very easily. And it was a three-story building, and uh, I crawled up on the roof when the missile started to come down with my camcorder and photographed this missile raid on the Palestinian people, the, the people of Gaza City, on that Thursday, Thursday night about 3 a.m. And this is the sounds that people in Gaza hear almost every night somewhere in Gaza. If you live there, you'll hear this sooner or later. And if you hear that in the distance, that's a bomb. But that's about the fourth explosion. Last night, Large numbers of people killed. Now I hear the ambulances running. Hi, uh, my name is Shireen. I'm from Gaza.
Shireen's home, the Gaza Strip, is the best example we can find of the bitter and ungodly fruit of Christian Zionism. I'm Palestinian from Gaza, which is um, considered as a big jail. Can you imagine this feeling that I feel always when we are, we are bombed? Apache helicopters hoovering up there. Here comes a missile coming down. It's happening just at bedtime here, 9 o'clock at night. It's just when the kids go to bed. This feeling, exactly this feeling, that you are in your room, in your bed, you're praying. Here we are again, the choppers, very close this time. He's up there terrorizing people shooting from right behind us. There's another bomb. You're praying. Because you feel that your room, only your room will be bombed from the whole building. Here comes another one fired from a much lower angle right off to my left. They're coming right down across the uh, town. This one fired right over our head. It's 3 a.m. and the killing is going on. Imagine, the United States paying for all this. You do not have him, you do not have her, you have a news saying that go to the hospital because he's there, he's dead, he's in the fridge. You have witnessed a killing air raid. And you have heard Shireen tell us of her prayers that the next Israeli bomb will not hit her bedroom. The occupation and bombing of 1.5 million Gazans like Shireen would end overnight were it not for the enabling support of well-intended and otherwise decent Americans who do not know what act they support. This film is dedicated to Shireen from Gaza and others, some Arab followers of Christ and some Muslims who aided in the making of this film. Shireen asked Charles Carson, who filmed her interview, could he fix this? He couldn't tell her that he could fix it, but We Hold These Truths is dedicated to keeping that promise to try and not to quit trying. We implore you to show this film to every mainline pastor. Traditional and Orthodox Christian churches do not believe that God ordained the state of Israel, so they will listen. They need to go further in understanding the roots of Christian Zionism so they can take their part in recovering America for God. Yeah, we can cut the clip there, Kim. So that finishes the clip. That's uh, it was an excellent uh, okay, documentary. I a clip on the background. Yeah, hold on there a second there, Chuck. <laughs> hold on. I uh, I just played the clip, the tragedy and the turning part one. Um, I was very moved by this this uh, documentary you did. Um, I got to admit, it brought tears to my eyes when I first watched it. It brought tears to my eyes the second time I just heard it. I recommend listeners to RBN, please go to the website, whtt.org. That's weholdthesetruths.org. And please go down in the right-hand side corner there and find that video, and please play that video, watch it, send that to other people. Uh, it has great impact, uh, great emotion. I, I just, I moved one night to see this.